Elon had a very violent childhood. He was beaten up by bullies. He was socially awkward. Was that he would switch from one personality to another very quickly. You're, you're probably one of the best interviews I've had all week, so thank you. 지난 약 20년 동안 미국에서 가장 영향력 있는 전기를 뽑자면 두 분을 뽑을 수 있을 것 같습니다. 옛날에 돌아가신 분의 전기 중에서는 Ron Chernow의 Hamilton이라는 Alexander Hamilton의 전기를 뽑을 것 같아요. 많은 상을 이겼고 인기도 많았고 브로드웨이 뮤지컬로도 제작돼서 많은 미국인들에게 미국 역사를 보는 눈을 바꾸게 해준 그런 책이죠. 하지만 최근에 돌아가셨거나 우리와 동시대를 살고 있는 분의 전기 중에서는 월터 아이작슨의 스티브 잡스 전기가 있을 겁니다. 전 세계에서 선풍적인 인기를 끌었을 뿐 아니라 오늘날까지도 많이 회자되고 인용되는 책이죠. 일론 머스크는 수많은 논란의 중심에 있기 때문에 어떻게 보면 많은 소음에 가려져서 그 사람을 보기가 굉장히 어려운 위치에 있는 사람이라고 생각을 합니다. 일단 비즈니스 측면만 봐도 어떤 사람들은 스페이스X와 테슬라 같은 불가능해 보이는 사업을 성공시킨 어마어마한 천재다 라고 얘기를 하는 반면에 어떤 사람들은 그 사람의 사업이 수익률 측면에서 다른 기업에 비해서 압도적으로 높지도 않고 또 보링 컴퍼니처럼 굉장히 허황된 꿈을 피치해 가지고 기업 가치를 올리는 확스터다 라고 평가를 하기도 하고요 비전에 대해서도 논란이 많죠 일론 머스크는 기술을 인류를 구하는 방향으로 적용해 나가는 선구자다 라는 평가가 있는 반면에 어떤 사람들은 머릿속에다 칩을 넣는다든지 인공지능 같은 것을 보고는 너무 한 사람의 손에 많은 권력을 쥐게 하는 방향으로 기술을 이끌고 있다 라고 평가를 하기도 해요 이 월터 라이작스는 그 소음을 뚫고 베일에 가려진 일론 머스크의 모습을 그려내기 위해서 일론 머스크의 스페이스 X가 있는 텍사스의 트레일러에서 생활하면서 2년 동안 일론 머스크를 관찰을 했고요. 그 결과로 이 일론 머스크 책을 썼다고 합니다. 저는 이 어려운 섭외를 통해서 줌 통화 연결에 성공을 했습니다. 그가 본 일론 머스크의 모습은 과연 어떤 모습이었는지 직접 물어보기로 했습니다. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to your Korean readers. Thank you for having me. My personal opinion so far has been that he's the 21st century version of the 1950s and 1960s techno wiz who wanted to build perfect cities out of aluminum or plant scientifically. Guys like Bangmeister Fuller who wanted to airdrop aluminum houses out of airplanes and build uh, American cities that way. Having spent two years with him in his day to day, What is your assessment, finally? I don't agree with your assessment of being one of the visionaries of the 1950s who believe in cities dropped from the sky. I think he's an executor, a person who can engineer. And when I watched him, what he really cares about is not just envisioning a product, but executing how it would be engineered and then how it would be built. He cares as much about the factory and the assembly line as he does about the design of the product. So I think he's somebody who's already achieved totally historic things. That said, you're right. He's polarizing. He's a jerk. And so that's what makes the book interesting. Do the qualities that make him so driven, that get him to be so successful, and it's not just about money. I mean, this is the most important things in the world he's already done. There is this uh, two image of Elon Musk that people have a hard time putting together. Like when he's in public in front of the camera, he's one of the most jovial, friendly. The bad way of looking at it, I guess, is attention seeking person in the world. And then among his employees or, you know, his business persona is that he doesn't care about people's feelings and he just thinks about the outcome. Having spent two years with him in his personality, how do these two elements coexist? That's a great question because one of the biggest surprises to me was that he would switch from one personality to another very quickly. And it would almost be as if there were multiple Elon Musk. And as you say, I could be with him one afternoon and he would be funny and he'd be looking at silly movies on his phone and laughing, you know, about the craziest things. And then he would be in engineering mode where he would be really focused. I mean, almost frightening, you know, quiet and focused on an engineering problem. And then at times he'd be inspiring, talking about going to Mars and how important that was for humanity. But as you also say, then he could go dark. Once every couple of days, there would be an hour or two where he suddenly got dark and angry and mean. 
It was, I don't know if you know the story, uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Of course. But it'd be like watching somebody transform from one person to another, but be in the same body. Mm -hmm. And when he was in the Mr. Hyde mode, he would just say things that were really, really tough on people. But then he would snap out of it and he would hardly remember the way he was when he was in Mr. Hyde mode. Wow. <laughs> 저는 또 하나의 질문이 있었습니다. 요한 하리 작가가 쓴 스톨른 포커스라는 책을 제가 얼마 전에 제 영상에서 커버한 적이 있는데요. 이 책에 보면은 이런 장면이 나와요. 테크놀로지를 이끌어가는 수많은 UX 기술자들이 모여 있는 자리였대요. 거기서 한 강사가 당신들이 디자인하는 세계에 살고 싶으니까 라고 물어봤다고 합니다. 근데 놀랍게도 그 기술자 중에 단한 명도 내가 지금 만들어가고 있는 세상에 살고 싶지 않다. 사실 우리가 개발한 테크놀로지가 인간의 행복을 더 향상시키고 있다고 생각하지 않다 라는 뜻으로 해석할 수도 있겠죠. 그 장면이 큰 임팩트를 줬는데 일론 머스크는 어떻게 보면 세상을 가장 빨리 변화시켜 나가고 있는 사람 중에 한 명이에요. 그가 꿈꾸는 세상 자동차가 스스로 운전하고 우리는 운전대에 손을 대지 않는 세상 우리의 머리에 칩이 들어있는 세상 이런 세상에 과연 일론 머스크 자신은 스스로 거기에 살고 싶어 하는가 그리고 만약 그런 세상에 살고 싶어 한다면 도대체 왜 그런 세상에 살고 싶어 하는지가 궁금했습니다. Let me ask you, uh, do you have a Tesla? Uh, no, I don't. And do you have a gasoline powered car? Yes, I do. Do you want to live in a future of gasoline powered cars? No, but I really do enjoy that clutch. and stick shift <laughs> as amusement. But do you want to live in a world in which uh, people are driving gasoline powered cars or electric cars? Probably electric cars. I mean, if I look at the world yeah. as a whole. Yeah. And who do you think is moving us into that world best? Elon Musk, I would mm -hmm. say. He loves his Tesla and he loves the futuristic design. You might not like handle that pops out on the Tesla, but now Mercedes and other great car companies are doing the same. But then you can just buy a different model Tesla and get your own handle. But it's nice of you to say for yourself, oh, I like having a clutch or something. Mm -hmm. But if you're thinking about the future of the world, you're going to want to say the future should look like the future. Mm -hmm. And that should be a future of electric vehicles. What about like his involvement with neural links or generative AI? Is that the kind of world that he wants to live in? Or is that the kind of world that you'd want to live in? So well, let's do Neuralink. Neuralink is, as you know, a chip that gets implanted into your skull. And with little wires, it can pick up your brain signals. One thing for the distant future is if you want to connect to your machine, How do you usually communicate with your computer? Mm -hmm. Keyboard, 200 characters per minute you can input. What if you could transmit what you wanted to your computer at a million bits per second? That would keep you closely tied to your computer and make sure your computer followed your will and desires, not vice versa. But one of the really slow things that make it seem we don't live in the future is what I would call the low bandwidth of the amount of bits that can move between us and our computers. We're still mm -hmm. using our, well, it's getting worse. I used to use all 10 fingers. Now I use my two thumbs to communicate with my devices. And that's a really slow, bad way to do it. Do mm -hmm. I want to live in the future where I can think? Can you please call up Zoom? Can you please open the car door? And my iPhone knows what I'm thinking and it transmits that. Yeah, I'd love to live in that future rather mm -hmm. than one in which I have to use my thumbs. And what about in the meantime? I'm watching people who are paralyzed. Mm -hmm. Some of my friends, I'm getting older. They're getting Parkinson's disease or Lou Gehrig's disease. They can't use their fingers and their hands and their legs. They can't walk. If they could have a chip and they could walk and run and play tennis. So I think Neuralink will be very, very important. I read your Steve Jobs book, and I've also read a long time ago your book, The Innovators. And I see sort of a common thread between the innovators that you describe. Usually the drive to innovate come from darkness in the soul or some, or some wound from the past. And from what I understand, I'm really excited to dig more into the book, is that Elon Musk opened up a lot about his childhood to you during the two years that you spent with him. What are some of the, the wounds you think that's driving him? I think that in order to be a good innovator, you have to have a disruptive passion. Then you asked me about what about Elon's disruptive passion? 
how much does it come from childhood? Well, a lot, because Elon had a very violent childhood. He was beaten up by bullies. He was socially awkward. And at one point, the bullies on the playground at school, one of them smashed his face so bad he had to go to the hospital. But the scars from that were minor compared to the scars that came when he went home from the hospital. And his father, who had that same dark and light personality, made Elon stand in front of him for an hour and a half and berated him, told him it was his fault told him he was stupid. When he's been a victim. Yeah. And so Elon had this dark demons from his childhood, these psychological problems from his childhood that are still there today. And sometimes he's able to harness those demons to become a drive that gets him to places that you and I probably aren't going to get to. But also there are times when those demons run wild and he gets very depressed or he gets manic and he gets mean. Mm -hmm. And so the story is about a complex human character with a lot of demons that are both deviling him and driving him. And what's also interesting is that you said that a lot of great innovators have disruptive personality. In technological sphere, disruption is usually a good word, disruptive technology or disruptive innovation. But in normal language, disruption is not a good word having worked on other innovators as well. How do innovators reconcile themselves with the fact that they are, in fact, doing good for human beings in general, maybe, but they're also a disruptive presence in a lot of people's lives? This is one of the most important questions in the world today. And you're right that the word disruption cuts both ways. And so you can look at all the disruption that has happened over history through technology. And sometimes people resist it. Now you go way back to in England, when the new technology in France and England is weaving looms Mm -hmm. that make beautiful fabrics by having looms that weave it, and even steam powered things. And this puts weavers out of work. It's disruptive. But we get sometimes nostalgic for the metronome that goes tick, tick, Mm -hmm. tick in an analog fashion. And so I do think we have to see what is just us being too nostalgic for things like that we don't need and what are the true values that we have to protect. So Mm -hmm. I will get to the most disruptive thing, which is journalism and the spread of information has been disrupted. This is both good and bad. When I was first in journalism, if you wanted to spread information, you had to work under editors or people who supervised you. Now it's different. Now there are people like yourself. Is that good or bad? I would say good 80% of the time. We need people like yourself who can be disruptive and say, I'm going to spread the word in a new way. But I also know that it's disruptive in some ways that aren't so good. Mm -hmm. You're obviously popular because you spread information that's reliable, good, interesting, and thoughtful. But you probably have gone on either YouTube or Facebook or WeChat and seen people are spreading things, and they're popular because they're spreading things that are totally false or dangerous or get people enraged. So that's the biggest disruption. The big disruption is on the free flow of information, and we can argue. Is it 80% good or 90% good, this disruption? But we have to guard against that 10 or 20% where the disruption is not only something that makes us feel nostalgic for the old-fashioned paper that we got to open up, but is actually disruptive because it's harmful to Mm -hmm. democracy, harmful to society. The final question I have is that a lot of people who are going to be reading your book on Elon Musk and a lot of people who read your book on Steve Jobs are aspiring college students or or people who are just starting out in the business world. What would you tell them is the common thing that unites the innovators, great disruptors, great leaders, great business builders that you've researched in your lifetime? Number one is they're all a bit different. So know yourself, know who you are. A Jennifer Doudna is one of the nicest people ever and creates a lab around her of friendly people, and she's always nice to them. Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, they're hardcore, all Mm -hmm. in. You'll read my Elon Musk. He says being collegial 
is a danger because mm -hmm. you don't question other people. You, you try to be too nice to them. So rule one is there's no rule one. You have to <laughs> be who you are. Number two is that no matter who you are, a nice person like Jennifer Doudna or a driven person like Elon Musk or Steve Jobs is you have to have passion for what you do. You have to really care, not about making money, but about making something that'll change the world. And then the money will follow. Elon Musk didn't do what he did because he thought it'd make him the richest person in the world. So you have to just believe in your vision. And then finally, I think it's important to be like Leonardo da Vinci, Ben Franklin, Steve Jobs, and be interested in everything. Don't just stay narrowly focused on, I'm going to be a good coder, or I'm going to be a good hardware engineer. Someday, AI will replace all the coders. What you got to be is somebody who's interested in everything and sees how things fit together. So read a lot of biographies, I think would be my advice. That's a great advice. So if somebody reads the innovators, Elon Musk and Steve Jobs, maybe they can take and a the book. code breaker, read about it. Nice and the code woman. breaker. Oh, but I haven't read it. Read the nice woman <laughs> I'll go get it right now. <laughs> and the code breaker. And then they might arrive at the insight that you spent last few decades dedicating your life to. There'll be a great shortcut to arriving at the insights that you've arrived in a much harder way. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. I will subscribe to your YouTube channel. You're real good. You're, you're probably one of the best interviews I've had all week. So thank you. Wow. Thank you. That's a, a compliment. I look take forward to honor. meeting you in person. Many people with Elon Musk are very interested in the fact that they 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 are very interested in the 기술 발전에 대한 많은 사람의 의견과 더 관련이 깊다고 생각을 합니다. 기술이 너무 빨리 변하는 것이 인류의 위협이다라고 생각하는 사람들은 대체로 일론 머스크에 대해서 부정적인 평가를 내릴 거고요. 그에 반면해서 인류가 지금 직면하고 있는 여러 문제를 빨리 헤쳐나가려면 우리가 가지고 있는 과학 기술을 더 빨리 빨리 도입해 가지고 많은 사람들한테 이렇게 사용해야 된다라고 생각하는 사람들은 일론 머스크를 좋게 보는 것 같아요. 그리고 이 인터뷰를 보면은 월털 아이작스는 그런 시각에서 일론 머스크를 본다는 걸알 수가 있었습니다. 어쨌든 일론 머스크가 우리 세상을 많이 바꿔가고 있다는 데는 변함이 없기 때문에 이 책을 가지고 일론 머스크에 대해서 어떻게 생각하는지 대한 토론을 통해서도 우리가 미래의 세상을 어떻게 구상할 건지를 찾아볼 수 있다는 생각이 들었습니다. 오늘 조승연의 탐구 생활은 여기서 마무리하고요. 다음번엔 더 재밌는 역사 문화 이야기로 찾아뵙겠습니다. 안녕히 계십시오.